Matthew chapter 7, we'll be looking at verses 24 through 29 this morning. I love these verses here. Real, there's a lot here to be said. Uh, it really focuses us back upon the, the true rock, and that is Jesus Christ. Let me start with a, a, a little introduction, as I usually do, just to get you thinking a little bit. might even kind of sound humorous, but we all know men. Uh, men are peculiar people, um, very prideful. Uh, they know everything. They don't do nothing wrong. Um, and you know that if you were to give them a, a little uh, task to do, you know, something to put together, they'd throw the instructions aside and they would just start building the thing, right? And, and hopefully uh, they'll have this thing built and running and working in good condition without any spare parts on the side. Because oftentimes there's little spare parts on the side and you go, where did this come from? You know, and they ask you, will that go somewhere? No, 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 it was extra. They must have gave me extra. And so I, I didn't put it somewhere. And then you read the instructions, you realize, oh boy, it was way back there in step three of the 12 steps that I had to do, you know. And so now you got to take it all apart, you know. And of course you, you wait till she leaves, you know, so that you can take it apart and put it back together the right way, right? The right way. We're, we're just like that. Uh, I don't know why we're geared that way. We, we want to be right. We want to be able to do things on our own. Uh, thank God for Google now because you can just Google it and you can uh, take step by step by step by step. I need to change my oil on my car. And so I was thinking, okay, I'll just, I'll just change it. So I Googled it. I'm like, wow, this is so easy now. You can do anything by just Googling it. And the guy takes you step by step, uh, the uh, ratchets you need, the millimeter sizes, the oil you need, where everything is, and, you, and you're done. I'm like, oh, I can do this myself. And so um, we do that, don't we? Uh, it's important to read. It really is. It's important to read instructions. It's important to understand them. And it's important to apply them so that we get every, every part uh, in the right place. And how much more spiritually? And we're going to talk about that, that, that we read this word here that God has given to us so that we can put everything in order in our lives, so that we can have, hopefully, a peaceful, restful, and, and uh, continuous walk with the Lord that is more of a blessing than a cursing. And unfortunately, um, we don't listen to that advice from the pulpit or even from the scriptures. And so we have a walk that is uh, with repercussions because of the choices that we've made. So last week we ended in verses 22 through 23. So just to remind you so we get the feel of this because he does reference this. Uh, Jesus said, many will say to me in the last day, that is eschatology, that day when Christ will come back uh, for the church and he will set up his kingdom, that they will say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, if you look at verse uh, 21, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of God, but he who does the will of my Father, the will of my Father. And I asked you to, to actually highlight that because that's an important key. Even though they did works, they weren't the works that the Father required. Uh, you know what's interesting about Christianity is that we do have a Bible, a word, but it doesn't give us all the details for daily living. Um, you know, th those little gray areas. Uh, where do we live? The Bible doesn't tell us that. You know, Reuben, this is where I want you to live. It would be nice, and then you just go and do exactly what it says, but it doesn't tell you those type of things. And so those are the things where you're praying. You're seeking the Lord. Uh, you're asking for wisdom and, and, and direction. And then the Lord gives you that wisdom and that direction, and that's where that line comes. Uh, kind of uh, fits in where where um, we do what he's telling us to do. We're moving where he tells us to move. Because as Christians, we know when the Lord speaks to us in those gray areas. They're, they're, they're not clear, maybe to everyone else, but we know in our heart, we sense the Spirit moving, and we know God is saying, let's go there. Let's do that. Oftentimes, that's what pastors do in the churches. Um, Let's take a step of faith and, and, and let's get a trailer and, uh, because we have a need and let's see what happens. 
you know, as we get it and see who gets involved and who helps and, and so forth. And it doesn't always uh, work out the way you think it was, but the Lord told you to do that, and so you do it, and, and you just trust that he told you to do that. And so the word isn't always clear uh, to us, and those are the areas that we really need to pray on the Lord and, and know that if we have a solid foundation, if we have been reading the word of God, we'll hear the voice of the Lord, and it will be in line with, with the word. So today's theme is do it. Uh, build your house on the rock. So let's read the text, 24 through 27 first, and then we'll hit the last two verses there as Jesus closes up the Sermon on the Mount. It says, therefore, so in light of what we just read there, Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I liken him to a wise man who builds his house on a rock. And the rain descends, and the floods come, and the winds blew and beat on the house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. And the rain descends, the flood comes, and the wind blew and be on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. So here we see Jesus giving us his, his last words from the Sermon on the Mount here, and he talks about your home, your house, uh, where you live with your spouse and your children. He's getting very personal to the reader here, very personal to me and to you, and so we should hear what he is saying in these words, and he's telling us in the first verse uh, this picture, so we get this idea uh, of his words, his, his truth, uh, his scriptures, and, and how we ought to live by that because we're a wise person, we're wise people, and we want to build on that wisdom there. And if we build on that wisdom, then when this rain and this storm and this chaos begins to come like this morning with what's going on, uh, we can make good, sound judgments when it comes. And our house will maybe shake a little bit, but it, it won't be uh, destroyed. Uh, it won't slide off its foundation. It will be solid upon the rock. But if you don't do those things, and he's very clear in verses 26, then he says you're foolish because you built your house on sand. And, and in building your house on sand... If you think about it, as you start to build it and, and you're building the framework upon it and you're trying to nail uh, into the frame, into the sand, there's really nothing for it to grab. It's just, might as well just be putting a nail in there in the air. I mean, that, that's as, as good as it gets. And so he says, you're foolish. Uh, who would do that? And so when the struggles do come, your house is destroyed. Uh, it's blown all over the place. And you see that in some people's lives. I see it as a pastor and in a church, and I see how people react to certain conditions uh, that take place in their lives, and some of them stand and some of them fall. Some, some of them rise above the situation, and some of them just can't take it, and they're out and they're running. And then you see that so clearly, and, and oftentimes, more than often, you can point right to the problem is they haven't been reading their word. They haven't been studying uh, God's scriptures they haven't been in church they haven't been fellowshipping they haven't been praying and so there's no power there's no foundation there and so it's it, it just is destroyed and, and then you see those that that rise and they stick it through and their eyes are focused on the Lord and and they're applying the scriptures they're trusting in God even if it looks really bad and it's horrible but yet for some reason that foundation has been built it's on that rock and they're not going to be moved, they're going to stay strong, they're going to trust in God, and they get through it somehow. And we see it in life itself. Now, some commentators have looked at these scriptures, and they have uh, called these uh, scriptures a parable, a parable. Though it doesn't say it in our scriptures here that it's a parable in itself, but we can liken it to a parable, a truth, a comparison, in a sense, to this house and to our spiritual well-being. Uh, it is clear that Jesus is giving uh, this picture uh, to the crowd who are probably very familiar uh, with what Jesus is saying, especially in Israel. Is Israel has a lot of rock, a lot of uh, lime rock, um, a lot of homes that are built on rocks. A lot of times their, their foundation is literally on a rock. That is their foundation on, a, on the side of a hill or a mountain or on some terrain. And so they're very familiar in what he's talking about. Uh, the remainder of this chapter, though, um, as I said earlier, will conclude uh, the Sermon on the Mount. The last two verses, uh, we'll see the response from the crowd 
from Jesus' words. Now, there's a familiar reference in Ezekiel pertaining to this that I thought was interesting when I found it because it's the same truth in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. Ezekiel 13.10 says, Because indeed, uh, because they have seduced my people, saying peace, when there is no peace, and one builds a wall, and they plaster it with untempered mortar, say to those who plaster it with untempered mortar, it will fall. Uh, there will be flooding rain, and you, O great hailstorm, shall fall, and a stormy wind shall tear it down. Surely when the walls has fallen, it will it not be said to you, where is the mortar? with which you plastered it. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will cause a stormy wind to break forth in my fury. And so a reference in the Old Testament pertaining to basically the same thing. If you use bad material, if you build on bad material, then your house will fall. And so God has a principle here for us to really take hold of. And that principle is what are you building on? What are you really building on? And so wise people will hear what Jesus is saying here, and they'll respond accordingly. They will take heed to what he's saying, and they will want to build upon that rock. But foolish people will just disregard it. Oh, you know, I'm wiser than that. I know better than that. My friends would never lead me the wrong way. And uh, I'm the one that will, will be able to do that and get away with it and so forth. And that's a lot of deception from the enemy. Essentially, it's useless to call yourselves a Christian if we do not practice the things that Jesus taught us in the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, why call yourself a Christian if you're not going to read your Bible and you're not going to do it anyway? Uh, why come to Christianity? You don't believe it anyway. You know what's so interesting? I've been noticing this a lot more with people is, is the enemy has, has really succeeded in confusing the world. Uh, there are so many religious systems out there that Christianity is kind of lumped up in, in with it all. And so when we start professing that we know the Bible and this is what the Bible says and you know their thoughts are yeah that's what they all say yeah that's what that guy over there said when he's talking about being healthy wealthy and wise he's telling me he believes the Bible too you know and it's so hard to discern today and that's why I think that we really need to be on our knees and we actually have to have a hunger to know the truth to seek out God and ask him show me the truth so that I'm not taught by any man, but by your spirit. And so when I hear the word of God, I can agree with the word of God so that I can build my house upon it. Not just listen to some guys telling me what he thinks the word is saying. So Jesus is giving us a warning here about the foundation upon which we build our faith, that we are to build it upon the word of God. James 1.22 says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourself so he's clear that that we are to read the word and we are to do the word not just hear it and walk away saying that's a wonderful word or that's what my wife should do or that's what my children should do no you should be doing it first Matthew 28 20 says teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you and lo I am with you always even to the ends of the ages now Jesus is telling his disciples this is your responsibility that you are to teach, teach these things, what is in the word, that they are to observe them, do them again. That's the responsibility of a pastor, is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Unfortunately, we, um, we don't esteem pastors anymore, or teachers and leadership anymore. We really don't, not in the United States. There's no respect for them. Everyone knows what's right, and they're doing, it, doing what's right in their own eyes. I was talking with someone the other day about this whole issue, how we can jump from one church to another church. That's always been wrong. As I can remember 30 years ago, and pastors talking exactly the same thing, you know, that you shouldn't be jumping from church to church. It's the same situation back then as it is, is today, probably worse more today. I think God calls you to a body. And he calls you to that leadership and he calls you to submit to that leadership because you're a part of the body of Christ. We have this idea that we live in the United States. We don't live in the United States. Our home is not the United States. And I know that we would all protect it and I would be right there with you, but this is not our home. We are sojourners through the United States. We 
We're blessed to be born here, but we're sojourners. Where do we live? We live in the kingdom of God because we have come to Jesus Christ. And he has a kingdom within the United States, actually within the world. And so whether it's the United States or whether it's in Iran in a small little church or whether it's some other uh, nation, the body of Christ is there. And if he's called you there or over there or here, you should be committed to that ministry. You should be committed to that leadership. Oh, but, but they don't do everything that, that I'd like to see done. Well, so what? So what? It's not about you and what you think should be done. It's what God has put there as the leadership and what God is directing them to do. You should be praying for them. Uh, this is October. This is uh, Pastor's Appreciation Month. I'm going to blow it right now. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you the truth, and I really believe it, is, is that when you go to a church, you're submitted to the leadership there in that church. You're a part of that body of Christ. You know, a finger can't decide all of a sudden, I don't really like being the pinky. I never get to do anything. I never get to hold the pencil. I never get to rip through the envelope. I just sit there and do nothing. You know, so I'm going to go be a thumb. And now he's over here bucking against a thumb because he wants to be a thumb. Doesn't do that. And Paul gives us that analogy of a picture. Am I being silly? No. I think I'm being truthful. There's a picture, a parable of, uh, of a body we're all part of that body. Where does Mariloma fit in in that body? I don't know where, but we're here. And we're to be connected together. And we can't just come and go because. And we recently had a, a couple leave because they said the, the, the people up here that were doing worship stunk. I'm like, wow, really? Well, I think your heart stinks. Because they're up here trying as hard as they can. They're worshiping God. They're trying to keep him the focus. And all you're doing is listening to what's out here instead of what's going up there. You know? and, and those are the type of things that destroy the body of Christ. And, and those are the type of people that are the pinky and they're trying to be a thumb, you know, or maybe even a head because they like being on stage and performing. And, and those are the people that go from place to place trying to be something that they're not to be and they never be because they're just floating around. And that's the struggle with not building upon the foundation. Our responsibility as a pastor, as leadership, is to make sure, as Jesus said, that the body of Christ observe the things that Jesus said. One of the things is that you should be using your gifts in the body of Christ. You should be using those gifts there. And some of you are not. He also said in Luke eleven twenty eight. he said, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. <laughs> keep it. Not just hear it. Uh, we live, in, again, in a day and age where we like to hear it. We, we can hear it on the internet. We can hear it on our phone. We hear it on the radio. We can hear it all day long. But are we keeping it? That's the important thing. First John 2, 3. By this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. John 3, 7. First John 3, 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous. And he... And just as he is righteous, and so practicing righteousness. So let's, let's look at this uh, real quickly here again as Jesus uh, shares it with us, and we'll break it up a little bit. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, again, of course, he's referring to the Sermon on the Mount, but I think that we can apply it to the whole scriptures, because Jesus would probably say, this is the word of God, and I live by every word out of the mouth of God, right? And not just by bread alone. He said that when he was tempted by the enemy. He says, and does them, underline that, and does them. That's important to Jesus, that we do them and not just hear them. Remember when the woman was caught in the very act of adultery, you know, and, and, and he did this great, great illustration, you know, you without sin cast the first stone. Great illustration for us that are casting stones. Whoever you are, cast the first stone. No one could cast a stone. They all dropped them and they walked away. And of course, he told the woman, your sins are forgiven you, but he added something at the end, right? What was it? Go and sin no more. That's the doing part. Yeah, I've forgiven your sins. Yeah, there's grace. But go and do no more sinning. Stop it. Stop it. And we think it's that grace allows us to sin, and that's not the case. Jesus says, does them. That's what makes the wise man. When we hear God's voice and then we respond to his voice, uh, this was the problem with those right, that we're saying, Lord, 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 let us in. 
know, did we not cast out demons? Did we not do this? Did we not do that? Well, it was clearly they didn't do the Lord's will. They weren't keeping his word. They were doing what they wanted to do. <clears throat> I remember um, years ago there was uh, a guy, I can't remember his name right now, and he was a part of a church. And what happens is, is that um, he, he thought things should be run a certain way. And so he became an island on his own. And God hasn't called us to be islands. Uh, a hand doesn't go and decide, I'm tired of the body. I'm going to go float around and become my own body. You know, and there are people like that. Well, if I can't join the church and, and do what I want in the church and do it my way in the church, then I'm just going to do it outside the church. I'm going to become a church. Oftentimes those guys are probably called to be a pastor of a church and they should probably start their own church because they're not willing to submit to the leadership in the body. And so they become an island, and they float out there, and they have their own little church. Oh, they don't have an organized church, but they're a church, and people look up to them, and they're giving people advice, and they're directing them because they think they're the pastor uh, of their little island and so forth. And that's not how the function of the body works. That's far from what God has said or established. We need to be doers of the word, um, I liken him to a wise man who builds his house on a rock. Now, I love rock, and that's a great idea, but the Greek word would better be bedrock, which gives you a big different picture, right? Not just a rock, a bunch of rocks, but a bedrock, something that's actually connected to the earth, and it's solid, and it's big, and you can't move it at all. Even if the earth shakes, it's still there. It's not going to be movable compared to a little rock. I used to work up in um, Forest Falls here, uh, Highway 33, and you go up uh, past um, Mentone, Yakaipa, and there's a place way up in there, and there's a church, there's a, a, a Christian camp there, beautiful, beautiful place, homes along the side of the mountain and so forth. Well, I would love to go up there after a rain like this, uh, when it just poured down. Uh, there are certain places where the water just collects together, and it literally torrents down the hill, and you see rocks, boulders that are huge, and they actually roll with the water. In fact, just recently, um, there was a couple, I believe, uh, hiking up there, and the guy thought he could cross over the water, and he didn't. He fell in the water, and of course, with all those rocks there, uh, even small rocks, you know, he ended up dying because he thought he could do it. And, and so, I like the thought of a bedrock. Jesus is our bedrock. He's anchored, he's solid, and we need to build our house upon him. Jesus said, I liken him to a wise man who builds his house upon that, that rock. Reminds me of the Old Testament um, and how Moses uh, was told to speak to the rock and it gave forth water. You know, the second time he was, he was supposed, I'm sorry, the first time it was smite the rock and it gave forth water. The first, second time just speak to the rock. The rock represented Jesus Christ at that time. Um, he is our rock and the scriptures are very clear that Jesus is our rock. He's our foundation. We need to build upon him. And he says in verse 25, when the rains descended, the floods came. And this is talking about the heavy rains, the torrents, uh, the struggles in life, uh, those type of things. When they come, when they come and the winds blow and beat that house, then it did not fall for it was founded upon that solid rock. Now, I, I think of those seven. Here are those young people in school living their life. And these are, and I'm going to focus just on the seven, the, the seven that were Christian. Um, not that the others didn't matter at all, and that's not what I'm saying, but just these are the Christians. They're, they're living their life. They're living out their Christianity. You know, they're, they're going to church. They're praying. They're seeking the Lord. They're trying to do the best they can, and now they're in class, and this situation just happened where a guy stands up who they have found out um, that he, he had just recently uh, converted to Muslim. And he hated religion. Uh, the Times re, uh, reported that he actually um, asked all the students to stand up if they had a faith. Uh, the ones that uh, did not have faith or were atheists, he ended up shooting them in the leg. But the ones that had faith, he'd ask them, are you a Christian? And then he would point the gun at them, and when they'd say, yes, I'm a Christian, he says, well, you're going to go meet your God, and he would shoot them. And he went down the line to all seven of them. Now, do you think they expected that to happen that day? I don't think so. They weren't even prepared for that. But I think the preparation that they did before that is what prepared them for that day. 
because they had a solid foundation. And, and you can't do something like that without a solid foundation. You have to have a solid foundation. If you're living a life that's wishy-washy, that's lukewarm, like we hear in Revelation, then you won't have the strength to stand up at that moment like that. And so what an experience. What a testimony uh, to the fact that they were building upon the rock of God. And they were able to go through these torrents, these winds blowing of trials in life themselves to the point where they became martyrs for Christianity because that's what they were, where they were martyrs. They weren't just murdered, they were martyrs for their faith. It was because of their faith that they were murdered. Not because they were Americans, not because they were not religious, it was because they were Christians. They got killed. Someone pointed them out. Whether it was a Muslim group or whether it was the enemy who hates Christianity. And it just seems Christianity is always pointed out no matter what is going on. We are the haters. What do you think would have happened if a Christian had gone in there and killed a bunch of Muslims? There would have been a big uproar. A big uproar. Riots in the streets. Riots in the streets. If it was an African American. I'm not saying it's always that way, but if. Right? But Christians, they're supposed to be loving, forgiving, you know, and all that stuff. So we just accept it. And that's true. We do. Because we know absent from the body is present with the Lord. And we know that all seven went from martyrism to glorification before their Savior Jesus Christ as they met him face to face. So they're built upon that solid rock and nothing could shake it. Not even a gun to their head could shake it. Uh, that's a testimony and a beautiful testimony to have. So it did not fall for it was founded on the rock, the rock of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Verse 26, but everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like in a foolish man who builds his house on a sand. I, I don't think anybody ever starts off to build on sand. You know, they, they, don't, they don't make plans and, and they find a piece of property and think, well, let's just build it right there on the sand. Um, at least in the, United States, maybe in other places they build on sand and have uh, dirt foundations and so forth, uh, but they want a solid foundation because it's foolish and it's foolishness, and it would be foolishness for us to think that we can build on anything other than Jesus Christ, uh, you just can't, I don't know if you saw recently, and I'm get, I know I'm getting a little political here, um, Donald Trump just had uh, all the faith teachers pray for him. Now, whether he, he did it or, or didn't uh, uh, have any idea what was going on, but they all prayed for him. These are all the teachers that want to be wealthy and want to protect their religious rights because they can make money, lots of money, millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. And so they were all prophesying over him and how he's a man of God and God's going to anoint him and he's going to change the world and the, and the whole bit. You know, uh, that's not a foundation that you want to build upon because all of that's going to crumble there, there's a scripture by the way in Galatians chapter 5 it's really clear and it's not one that's mentioned quite often but it's in the scriptures and it talks about heresies heresies are false prophets and and we know that Jesus talked about uh, that before uh, what we just read earlier he was talking about the fruits and bad fruits and so forth um, <clears throat> and they are literally bad fruits in Galatians 5 when he talks about the works of the flesh, and then in verse 19, it says, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, and then he says heresies. Heresies. Heresies are false teachings. They're not, it's not scripture. These are the guys that say, God spoke to me that you need to do this or do that. They're the ones that are manipulating the scriptures, twisting them and turning them. That's heresies, and they will not inherit the kingdom of God, it says, if they practice it. So these guys are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. That's not a foundation that you want to build upon. I love Calvary Chapel just because of the fact that it goes through the scriptures. Genesis to Revelation, book by book, chapter by chapter, simply teaching the scriptures, just simply teaching it. You, you don't have to be, you know, a science uh, rocket scientist or anything like that. You just, just go through it and, and just minister what the word is saying to us and you do fine if we just follow what it says. Uh, but this topical and these um, other ways and means of teaching the word of God, yeah, sometimes it just is a waste of time, I think. We need to be in the word 
from end, from beginning to end. The house that lacks that solid anchor will ultimately be destroyed, the Bible says. Uh, again, Ezekiel, you remember the times of Ezekiel. Ezekiel, they were into idolatry. They were bringing idols into the church, and they were struggling with the keeping of the word of God. And Ezekiel also mentions something about this foundation um, and the fact that they weren't um, obeying the word of God. It says in 33, 32, Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song of one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear your words, but they do not do them. And that was their struggle at that time, is they weren't doing the word of God. Ezekiel must have been a great speaker because the scripture says that they would listen to his voice and it was just so pleasant, so lovely to hear. It was just so encouraging. And yet, they didn't hear the principles that he was teaching. Uh, the, the rock foundational truths that were there, and they weren't doing it. They were walking away just well pleased, but not willing to change. So the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell with a great fall. So now we come to 28 through 29, as Christ ends his sermon on the mount says in verse 28, So it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teachings, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So immediately the crowd recognized the authority that Jesus had and that his teaching was different compared to the religious leaders' teaching. His teaching had substance. It had style. Uh, he, spoke, he spoke prophetically with confidence and with power. Um, great orator, but yet it had substance to it. It had truth and principles that you could grab out. It was down to earth, and he used illustrations that he could see around him within the community that he lived and dwelled, that the people dwelt, and he would take references from their history, uh, from their background, and he would teach all of this as though it was his own words, his own words. And, and that really caused them to be amazed at how he taught. If you want to aspire to anyone, you know, try to teach like Jesus. Try to present the word like he presents the word. And a quick illustration here of just, you know, like a storm and building on a rock and then referring it to our lives that we're to build upon a, a rock of God. It's very simple and you get the idea and you go, yeah, that's what we should be doing. Well, how do we do that? How do we do that? And then figuring out how to do that. Now, the how we do that, that's an interesting part of it. That's the application of it. That's the doing of it, right? How do we do that? And Jesus gave them that. How, this is how you do it. And they were blown away by that. I know how I did it. When I first got saved, I went through the Word. That's the first step, by the way. If you're a believer, you should have already been through this. If, you, if you're a believer that's a year old or two years old, you have already should have been through the Word of God. No excuse. No excuse. If you haven't been through it, then get through it. Start reading it and force your way through it and then continue to do so. That's the first thing you need to do. And then once you do that, then you need to find a church and you need to be committed to that church and that ministry and get your family committed to that church and that ministry. Not every other Sunday, not, not once a month, every single Sunday. Don't let a little rain keep you from church because your sins didn't keep Christ from going to the cross. He sacrificed everything. And so you have to be committed to going to church, fellowshipping with people, interacting, mingling, growing in that relationship. I know some of you are shy. Some of you don't like to talk. You don't like people. You know, I hear that all the time. God will change that in time. God will change that in time as you fellowship with the body of Christ, as you uh, get involved. And, and when you do that, then you start praying, Lord, show me where you want my family. Show me what you want us to do in the church. And then you get connected to the church. Once you do that, then you're building on that solid foundation. <clears throat> then the other things outside of that are fine. You know, we, like with my boys, <clears throat> we found things that they could do as long as it didn't affect the church. So they played tennis. Tennis didn't come on Wednesday nights or, or Sundays or youth nights and things like that. That was always second to church. I wanted to make sure they understood that church was number one in their life, the body of Christ, very important. Uh, once in a while, they, 
they got to go out, you know, periodically, but it wasn't an, a consuming thing. And so that's how you begin to build. And then you build on top of all that, then you build. You start reading books on family. You start going to conferences. You start getting involved uh, with various ministries, and that's where you begin to grow. I, I, I grew up in a poor family. My mom and dad were from Texas, and then their parents were from Mexico. My dad got a third-grade education. My mom, a fourth-grade education. So they didn't have an education at all. So education wasn't a big deal in our family, not like it is to, with some Hispanic families today. And so I wasn't really pushed a lot to study and, and learn and go to college or anything like that. And, and so I didn't have that education I didn't know much, and so when I came to Christ and, and, and I wanted to be a better husband or a better father, I started reading books by Dobson. Just go pick up some books, you know, read through them, and say, this is how you become a father. This is how you treat your kids. This is how you spank them. I mean, just spanking is something. I would beat them before I became a I would beat them. They would do everything that I told them to do. And my kids would sit in chairs, and they wouldn't move unless I told them to move. That's how cruel I was. And kids would come out, come on and play. And they're like, no, why not? Can't move yet. Dad didn't say that. And that's how I was. And I realized that that's not how you raise children. You're not to hit them with your hand. I don't hit my kids with, well, I, I didn't hit my kids with my hand. I used a belt, you know, the seat of understanding. But I didn't make it personal. I wanted to make sure that my hands, when I raised it, you know, that they knew that it was ra being raised to love them or hug them or to help them, but not to hit them. I was raised in a family where my dad used his hand. And I can remember walking down the hallway, my dad would walk by and he'd raise his hand and I'd go like this because I thought he was going to hit me. Because that's what his hand was used for. And so I learned all those things from reading books. And, and it helped my family to grow. Uh, that's how you build on the foundation of Christ. Um, but you've got to lay that foundation on Christ first when you do that. <clears throat> so it astonished them, it says. Uh, it was when Jesus ended these sayings that the people were astonished. And the word astonished means overwhelmed. In fact, it's actually two Greek words, which I found interesting. It means out of and to strike. Out of and to strike. To drive one out of its senses. And they were just blown away by it. They weren't, li they weren't words like... Um, the scribes, and he says in verse 29, for he taught as one having authority and not as the scribes. The scribes were an interesting group of people. Uh, after the Babylonian captivity, they were the ones that got in charge of, of keeping the, uh, the scriptures together. They would rewrite them, and they were so meticulous at rewriting them and making sure everything was just kept. And, and because they rewrote them, you know, constantly writing new Torahs and so forth and the scriptures, uh, what happens when you do that all day long? You start to know it. <laughs> And so all of a sudden they're like, hey, these guys have some wisdom. Where are they getting this from? Well, they're writing the word of God down every single day. Uh, something to be said about writing the scriptures down. Uh, that's another thing that we used to do. I know that uh, in my work truck, I would take scriptures that I wanted to memorize and I'd put them on stickies and put them all over my truck. So they were always there. And sometimes I'd leave them there for months and I tried to memorize those scriptures. They're gone now, but <laughs> I tried to do that. Even with the kids, we'd take stickies and we'd post them up in the bathroom. That's the best place to do it because they're just sitting there anyway, doing nothing. And they're just looking at that scripture all day long. Virginia would put uh, scriptures in their lunch pails and you know, lunch bags and, and things like that, just constantly, constantly having them uh, write them down. Um, if they got in trouble, they had to write scriptures down. The scribes were known for keeping meticulous scriptures. If they made one mistake, they threw it out, the whole thing. And they, they wrote on rolls, too. And so if the, if the mistake came way at the end, they had to throw the whole thing out and start all over again. So they got to know the scriptures, they became very wise, and they were dependable. And so they were known for their knowledge and their wisdom, and the people would go to them. But what were they doing? They were only quoting something or someone. The scribes would oftentimes say, Rabbi so-and-so said this. Rabbi so-and-so gave this illustration. We do that quite often today, you know, our pastors and so forth. But Jesus taught differently. He spoke as though... It was his word. Well, it was, because he's God in the flesh. And he was speaking with power and authority. That's the kind of power and authority that any pastor wants to teach. And those are rare to find. You have them out there like the Pastor Chucks, the John MacArthur's, and Charles Stanley, and 
uh, some of the others that are, that are out there. Um, I really think Dave Rosales is a great expositional teacher. I mean, he just sticks with the scripture, uh, tells you what the scripture is saying. He's really good at laying the foundation before he shares the scripture. You know, just a great orator of the word of God. Greg Glory is a great evangelist. Uh, he's great at telling stories and relating to, to uh, life and the situations. And then he brings you in and he, you know, you end up getting saved and not knowing what even happened. That's how I got saved. Th those are all great teachers and they strive to be like Christ. You know, teach like Christ. And so it amazed them. It amazed them. And I think that's one of the reasons that God has blessed them tremendously. So here's, here's my point to end. Is that if we build upon what Jesus has spoken in the word, we'll be blessed. If we lay that foundation first in our Christianity and, and lay it well, and it takes, it, is, it takes work. It does take work and it takes effort and you have to really make that effort to do it on a daily basis. Uh, one of the other things that we used to do is have devotions every night. And so we opened up the scriptures as a family and we read through the scripture every single night. Uh, if we had something going on, of course, we couldn't, couldn't read. Wednesdays we had church, so we didn't do it then, but we read every night. That builds upon that foundation. When you do that, you'll be blessed. That doesn't mean life will be easier. doesn't mean that struggles won't happen, but your house will not fall apart. It will not fall apart, as Jesus has said here. Why? Because Jesus' words are amazing. They are words with confidence, authority, and power as he spoke, and we can depend on them to be truth for our own lives. And so build your house on a solid foundation.